Our story begins as all things began in darkness. Remembering that formless void from which sprang all things. Contained within its shifting myriad infinities every possibility that has been and could be, but learning to see the shifting shadows of all things and make sense of them is the work of a disciplined lifetime. So let this story move forward a little bit to a time when the war against the Titans was won and the brothers Prometheus and Epimetheus were spared Tartarus in thanks for their assistance in overthrowing the Titans' rule. They were given the task of creating many things, all the beasts of land and sea and sky, and a special bequest to create a thinking being that could praise the Olympian gods for creating them and many things in their world. To all of these creations, boons were set aside, and Prometheus left much of the animal world to his brother and set about making humanity shaping them from clay, softening the earth with his tears when it was too brittle, too hard to take shape. And yet, after lovingly creating it, Prometheus found he could not give it life alone. And he took his creation to the goddess Athena, who breathed upon the clay likeness of the gods shaped by Prometheus, and so humanity began. Shaped by a god and given breath by a goddess. But when Prometheus went to the store of gifts set aside for creation, he found many of the best gifts for surviving in the world had already been given out. The sharp teeth the strong jaws, the thick hides, the coats of fur to keep one warm in the winter had all been given out. And so seeking inspiration, he returned to Olympus. And it was there, passing by the hearth of Hestia, that he beheld a gift worthy of a creation made in the form of the gods to praise them. It was there he thought of fire. And using a fennel stalk, he took an ember from Hestia's hearth and he brought it back to the earth and gave it to humanity, a light to push back the darkness. Now there are those who say that Hestia was in on this event, and there are those who say Prometheus stole it. Whichever is true, the king of the gods was not pleased that a divine property had been given to created beings, and he demanded a sacrifice in exchange for humanity being allowed to keep fire, a property of the gods. And so Prometheus slaughtered several cattle. He gathered together the fine meat and put it inside the unappealing stomach of a cow. And then he gathered together all of the leftover bones and awful bits, and wrapped that in the beautiful marbled fat. And he set this beautiful, sweet-smelling package on a fire. 
And Zeus chose the castoffs wrapped in fat, a fragrant and beautiful offering. When the deception was revealed, he was wroth. And he said very well, they may have the meat, but the fire that was taken returns to Olympus. Let them have their meat raw. And so darkness returned until Prometheus remembered. The sun rose every day. And the very next day, Prometheus took up a mirror and held that up as Apollo's chariot passed overhead. And he lit a torch. And having done so, he showed some people how to light their own torch, that fire might never be taken from humanity again. And once again, Zeus was not pleased. In some tellings of this story, Prometheus is punished for transgressing a second time, and giving humanity fire when Zeus had made his opinion clear. The story is a bit more complex than that, though. Zeus did call Prometheus to Olympus, and did demand an accounting. But what was asked was a name. Prometheus was a far seer. Among the things he had foreseen, was a child born to Zeus and a mortal who would overthrow the king of the gods. And it was the name of this child that Zeus sought, but Prometheus had also foreseen. What would become of Zeus? What would become of the world should Zeus possess this knowledge? And so he kept his lips sealed. And it was for this that he was bound to a mountain, to have his liver devoured every day. For eternity was the sentence. And a strange thing happened when Prometheus was taken out of the world. Things stagnated. Oh, there was light. It held back the darkness. But that was all. There were no innovative thoughts. Leaders could not see past the immediate crisis. Philosophers were happy with the work they had already done. Artists dreamed no new things. And technology ceased progress. And a few weeks into his captivity, Prometheus began to weep heavily until his body ran out of moisture until, like his ever-regrowing liver, it came back and he wept more. Some of those tears undoubtedly were for humanity, not progressing, not doing what he hoped for them. But he also knew a day would come that he would be needed, and he wept for the price. Now there are some who say, when Heracles came to free Prometheus, that he simply ascended the mountain, slew the eagle, and snapped the chains. Would that it were so simple. For Prometheus to be freed, an immortal, must choose to take his place in the underworld, must lay down their life, that Prometheus might return to the world. And what made Prometheus weep long days and many nights was the immortal who made that choice. Chiron, the trainer of heroes and the teacher of medicine, chose to sacrifice himself to Prometheus. And so for nearly 40 years, every single day, 
Prometheus cried his body dry. And when that day came, that Heracles ascended the mountain and slew the eagle, and Chiron with him sacrificed himself and went to the underworld on Prometheus's behalf, and the chains fell away. He had done his weeping. He hugged and thanked the son of Zeus and was immediately on his way. Traveling first to potters to show them a new way to mix clay for stronger bricks. And after he had done so, Everything he could have hoped for humanity came to pass. They innovated for themselves. Those stronger bricks made better houses. Prometheus showed them how to cook wood slowly, making what we would recognize now as charcoal, to make hotter fires that went longer. They used these things to make even stronger bricks, realizing they could use those not only for better houses, but to make enclosures for their fires. A few very clever ones even realized that they could take those bricks, thin them and bend them and create tiles so that they need not replace their roof every rainy season. Prometheus continued his labors, traveling to a place that would come to be known as Athens, where Athena was showing humanity the art of rhetoric. Prometheus joined his voice to hers, and together they showed humanity argumentation, organization, ways of grouping people and material effectively. They were joined in that place by Hephaestus, who showed humanity the art of the forge, with Prometheus showing those early blacksmiths the way to mend and tend a bellows. It is perhaps this reason why one of the only known cults of Prometheus was in Athens. Worshipped there at a great festival called the Promethea, where youths would light a torch in the grove of the academy and race to the city's center from the shrine of Prometheus. But this was no mere test of prowess at speed. The torch must stay lit from the beginning of the race to the end. This was a test of wit, the ability to create a good torch and the cleverness to keep it lit while moving quickly. It is no mistake, as Prometheus continued to travel, he showed many things to many, in many places, by many names. It is no mistake that to this day, innovation that pushes our concept of what is possible is called Promethean. Now like any virtue, inspiration, cleverness, can go too far. There are many stories I need not even tell you their names, I'm sure they have come to mind, in which Innovation for its own sake, untempered by wisdom, beget tragedy. There are any number of wars where innovation for its own sake, pushing boundaries solely for the sake of doing so, caused tragedy. It is perhaps for this reason of danger that Zeus did not wish us to have fire in the first place. After all, without fire, humanity lacks the capacity to destroy itself. 
The argument, therefore, of Prometheus is without fire. We cannot see the path to save ourselves either. Now it is true that I have told you a story, but I invite you to consider, was this story a ritual? And before you answer, consider, has a story ever changed your mind? And do you as a person have the power to change the environment around you. If a story has changed your mind and you have the power to change the world around you in any way, then could the right story told at the right time to the right person be the ritual that makes the world a better place? These sorts of questions lie at the heart of the work of Prometheus, to find a light, to lift it up and take it someplace previously unseen, previously darkened. And having seen something that was not seen before, to begin to make sense of what you see. This is not an easy task. This is work of metaphor. Think of the first time you attempted to describe a tree. Were you accurate? Did you describe a tree in particular or the idea of a tree? Would that description have told someone who did not know a tree what a tree was? If so, then I beg you, continue to do the work that you do in the world. If not, I encourage you, do not be discouraged. There is a reason many cultures have given their spiritual leaders titles that mean things like one who can see, one who can understand one that drives out the darkness. It is a work of great courage. In a world where we still reel from years of isolation, where our leaders antagonize one another and the common folk are left to wonder, is today the day that imperialism comes to rest at my door and hurt me. It is a work of great courage to show what has not yet been seen, to consider it, to describe it, to dream of what could be. But perhaps you are a person of great courage. Perhaps Finding one small light and carrying it someplace new is work you wish to do. If so, I am already thankful for you. And if not, I do understand. It is not for everyone. Whatever you should decide, I thank you for spending some time here in this shrine to Prometheus, and whatever your path may be, I hope that it is clear and filled with luminous possibility.